Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ken Culver, and I am your uh, Director of Research and Clinical Affairs. As an employee of Alk Positive, it's a real privilege to represent you in many settings around the country to try to amplify a number of the messages that Ross brought up and messages coming directly from you through Alk Talks, through uh, summits, and so forth. So it's my pleasure. Let's see, who are we missing? Christine, is Christine here? I don't know, I don't know that she's arrived Okay. We're gonna now talk a little bit about uh, some of the topics that Ross um, started and dig in a little deeper and diversify in our opinions. So. Okay, do these work? They do. They do, okay, great. Did you turn it on? You do need to turn it on. Does it work? Okay, thank you, Angel. I think so. We'll have to share microphones with Sheree. So, oh, no. everybody knows Ross, and of course, great. Uh, Angel is a, is a great friend from Michigan, and Sharish has been in multiple places in Michigan. He's got the whole state covered. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he's now, now in Detroit. <laughs> so if we could go to the next slide. R Ross started off by showing a picture of an elephant. I don't know who's controlling the slides. Is that something I do? <laughs> it would be helpful, wouldn't it? You couldn't get the microphone in there. There we go. Slides. Yeah, I'm a failure already. Um, the elephant in the room really um, are these implications of the Crown five-year data. So we're going to dig into that in a little more detail um, based off of what Ross just shared with all of us. And then the last half of our time, we're going to speak about treatment planning on first-line therapy. And this, so this again will, the goal of this is to say, what should you as a patient be doing when you're in this plateau? Yeah, you want to go back to work, take care of your family. But there are other things that are really critical that should be going on so that you can hopefully stay on that TKI as long as absolutely possible. There we go. So the big question for the panel to start off with is, should a patient with a stable response on a first-line TKI switch from electinib or brigatinib to latinib? And this is one of those Kaplan-Meier plots that we just saw from Ross a little bit ago. And you remember across the bottom, the horizontal line is time. And the vertical axis is the percent of patients, and the top is 100, and as Ross explained, as you go from left to right, each time, in this case it's PFS, each time a patient has a progression of their tumor, the curve gets lower and lower till you reach that plateau. And I put there the two definitions for you. The Kaplan-Meier curve, which Ross explained, is the time until something happens. So we commonly see that in oncology in graphs of PFS or overall survival. But what does PFS mean? It's the time from you being randomly um, started on the trial to when your disease progresses or death from any cause. And the idea is that if you're on a drug and you walk across the street and get hit by a car, how do you know the drug hadn't disoriented you? And that's why you got hit by a car. So those kinds of things are included in there to be fair because we can't really know for sure why someone may have died while they were on the trial. So I think it's always been interesting to me that that is one of the, the aspects of PFS. These are the criteria, definition of PFS taken directly out of the Crown Protocol, which you can find online if you want by going um, to the ASCO site. So Ross had this really great idea, actually has many, but in this case for this slide saying, let's put the three Kaplan-Meier curves side by side for electinib on the left, brigatinib in the middle, and elatinib on the right. And what I'd like to do now is hear, hear some from the panel, and of course we're gonna talk about the plateau, but I'd like to start off by asking the panel about what happens in the first three years. Because if you look at those curves, take lalatinib for example, about one third of the patients on lalatinib are progressed already. So there's a lot of focus on the right side of the curve, but what do we think about the left side of the curve? I think those are the 
Belks that Dr. Kamich was talking about, that um, right now we don't know yet who these patients are, but it's clear that they exist because even on these three drugs that are, you know, all have great efficacy and have a long tail at the end, there's a proportion of patients that will progress early. So these are the Belks, and we need to do more research to figure out who they are. Uh, the only thing I would add is the feeling is, the impression is that because the right side of the curve is so much better, that the left side of the curve is shallower, if shallow would be the right word, um, with Lord Latinin. So absolutely, not everybody has a progression-free survival even greater than two years. There are a proportion of patients that drop. But I think the fact that the right side of the curve is so good or better than the left side of the curve I mean, the other two uh, curves, that the hope is that the proportion of patients who have that early progression is uh, uh, less with, with lorlatinib. Um, I think that is the biggest thing. Nancy in the morning mentioned happiness and uncertainty. And, you know, I, I really love that concept, but as a doctor, that is the uh, trouble, the uncertainty is the trouble, because we still don't know who is going to do, who, who are the patients in that left side of the curve, in uh, left side portion of the curve, in any of these three curves. The other thing I will say is, and Ross pointed this out, 8% of chrysotinib patients were progression-free at five years. That's one in 10 patients, right? Now, we assume that all of those 8% of the patients are within the 60% that, will be that would have been progression-free if they had received lorlatinib at five years. I'm not sure we know that with 100% confidence, right? That is it possible that some of those, uh, maybe four out of 10, I mean, 4%, um, are actually in the portion of the curve on the right side, I don't know how clear I'm being on this, are actually above. That is, they would have progressed if they had received Lord Latinib. Now, our assumption right now is everybody who did well on Chrysotinib would also do well on Lord Latinib. Everybody who did well on Lord Latinib is all, uh, would have done well on Alectinib or Brigadinib would also have done well on Lord Latinib. I don't know that we know that with 100% certainty. I don't know what you think, Ross or Angel, about that. I think it's a really great point because crizotinib is an ALK, ROS, and MET inhibitor. So it potentially, you know, joint, make, adding two and two and making five here is, you know, potentially those who were predisposed to MET, maybe you're controlling them longer with the crizotinib. That's a great question. But having said all that, I personally feel that it is just difficult as a physician to get past the fact that the median PFS is more than twice, not just twice, but more than twice with Lord Latin. So Sharice, that being said, and, and I think when we look at we look at that curve on the right and you see the Lorlatinib curve, how couldn't you be how co you couldn't be excited about that? So one of the key questions that I'd like to hear from the three of you is, what patients would you not start on the latinib? Because you know, Ross, been a, a, we're going to come to side effects next, but and we could wait till the next the next slide. But I think that's one of the key questions because I'm looking at that, going, well, not every patient's going to be started on a latinib. So let's just say, for sake of 20% of new outpatients never get the option of a latinib for whatever reason in the front line. And then you have 20 more percent, let's say, who come off because of toxicity. And then you have 30 percent that are coming off from progression in the first three years. So this, these clinical trial results, as great as they are, are they going to be reflected now in what we see? I know I kind of went in a circular, circular way there, but I'm, I'm just thinking, who shouldn't be put on a latinib in the first line? So um, I, 
I think that's a really difficult question, but I, I want to jump back to your prior question about um, why people drop off and Dr. Gaggio's comment about the steepness of the curve and my eyes are terrible, but I think if I'm looking at the curves correctly, in the first six months on each of these curves, it's about 20% of patients will have progressed. And that is true whether this is electinib, bergatinib, or lorlatinib, if I'm looking at that correctly. So I think that first six months to a year is gonna be really critical because these are the patients, if they have the bulks that are at the highest risk for progression. And then, then the lorlatinib curve becomes much more impressive if they've kind of gotten past that timeline. And then it becomes a lot more of a plateau, um, like we just heard in Dr. Kamage's talk. So I think there's still that a lot of work to do in the beginning. And that leads to your question about how to properly select patients in the front line. Um, I think like with any cancer treatment, this has to be a discussion with the patient about the trade-offs, right? The toxicities um, versus also what the sites of disease are. We also saw very impressive CNS protection, so protection of um, cancer going to the brain or if you already have brain metastases, the ability of lorlatinib to control that. So a patient's cancer and where it is is gonna be really important. Um, but then balancing that out with all the different side effects like we will talk about. So um, I've heard some physicians say, well, I'm not going to start a patient on first line or latinib because one, I think they won't be able to handle the weight gain. Two, they've had prior brain irradiation and maybe they're more vulnerable to the CNS side effects. Are those individual sort of uh, concerns, or, or are there different aspects that would make you say, well, I'm, I, is, as great as that curve is, I really want to stick with, with electinib or brigatinib? Okay, can I, I, I want to address a little elephant in the room. I'm wearing my elephant socks, for those you can see. <laughs> you um, are, yes. Um, everyone in this room has already made a decision as to what they're on. Mm -hmm. the, the, this pitch about what do you start on is for the people who haven't been diagnosed yet. So it's, we're, we're kind of doing the opposite of preaching to the choir here. My impression, I don't know what the others think, is if you're diagnosed now, I would probably try and start you on lorlatinib because I don't know if you're gonna be a BALC or an ALC or a GALC or whatever, so I'm gonna give you the best odds. My issue with these side effects is it's the wrong starting dose. And so, I think the two things are the starting dose and being very clear what the side effects are and monitoring them carefully. So physicians normally don't get excited about weight gain because normally we think that's a good thing in an oncology clinic. We, so we have to learn that that's an issue and prevention is much better than, than cure in this regard. And the same with neuropsychiatric side effects. I would say in my practice, I start people on 50, maybe 10% tolerate 100, maybe 30% stay at 50, and the remainder end up at 75. So it's always tough to slightly deviate from what Dr. Kamit said after that wonderful presentation. <laughs> I've, I've known him a long time. And, in the, and the reputation he has, I have nowhere near the reputation that he has. But um, I, I've, I just sort of feel like, um, Lorlatinib is a drug that does have some challenges, but the challenges, I think as we have learned about them, we can potentially proactively manage. Is it possible in every patient? No, but it is possible in most patients is my sort of feeling. Um, I, I definitely felt Lorlatinib, oh, Christine. Um, Fashionably late. Welcome, Christine. <laughs> It's embarrassing when you live somewhere and you can't find parking. Yeah, right. So especially, I, I'm very sorry about that. Especially we came with flights yesterday. So. <laughs> and with the Microsoft outage. So uh, yeah. uh, shame on me. Um. Well, thank you for joining. Um, I, I personally feel that when we were using Lorlatum in a phase one trial, where we were using it in patients who had gone through multiple different treatments and then received Lorlatum, it was a lot more 
a harder drug to manage. I think in the first line setting, it is somewhat easier drug to manage. I actually do the opposite of what Dr. Kamich does. I actually start at 100. I like to prescribe the 25 milligram pills and it is always a challenge. It is sometimes a challenge to prescribe the 25 milligram pills and give the 100 milligram dose because I understand four pills of 25 are costlier than 100. And I actually try and see the patient very frequently in the beginning and then come down. So I like to go it come down. Now one of the reasons I like to start at 100 is I completely agree. I think in most patients, 100 probably is a higher dose than you really need. My thing is that the most, imp most impressive data, there's a lot of impressive data in Crown, is the CNS, lack of, lack of CNS progression, particularly in patients who did not have CNS metastases at baseline. And I am not certain that maybe 100 is, uh, maybe 50, 75 is good enough. What a little bit I have uncertainty of, is 50, 75 good enough even for the CNS on a long-term basis? And I do have some patients who are doing fine on 100 milligrams, and I will admit maybe I don't query their psychological system uh, symptoms to the extent that um, Dr. Kamich does, but I have some patients, I don't know the percentage, and I don't have as many ALK patients as Dr. Kamich has, but there are patients who do fine, so I like to do the reverse way because I'm looking at the potential for CNS control or maximizing the potential for CNS control. And I don't want to suggest we have data that 100 is better in controlling brain metastases than 15 patients, but I, I feel that is the unique feature of the drug and that's why I want to do it. The final thing I'll say is weight gain is a definite problem. And I, what I try to do in my best way that I can, I really have a conversation on nutrition, on exercise, and, and try to do a lifestyle change, which I, I, I feel like any way every patient should do. Um, and I think that that has managed uh, the weight gain. And I will agree that it happens over a long period of time and we probably have under-reporting of Crown and I'm not suggesting a lifestyle change is possible in every patient, uh, and that may mitigate only to a certain point. But to me, I come back to the fact, doubling of PFS is enormous. The lack of brain progression in patients who don't have brain meds. Forget about the patients who have brain meds. Important group, I'm not suggesting that that's not important, but the patients who don't have brain meds, not to have progression, pretty much through the course of the trial is very, very impressive. Mm -hmm. So Christine, thanks for joining us. And now I have a question for you. You told me um, patients have been coming to see you with the question, should I change tovolatinib and they're stable on brigatinib or electinib? How do you, how do you discuss that with a patient and what are the key factors in making such a decision? So I'll start with saying, hi, this is really impressive. Hi, everyone. I'm, I am, it is delightful to see you all this morning. It is so amazing that you all made it here with the crazy travel issues that are going on in the world. So welcome to Nashville. Please enjoy your time while you're here. I wish we had a little bit of better weather. It's kind of overcast and humid today. Um, but please enjoy your time here. It's lovely to see you all. Um, Ken, I think this really depends on how long the patient has been on therapy. So if somebody's been stable on electinib or brigatinib for a year or two or three, I certainly would not recommend a switch at that point if they have stable disease or tolerated the therapy. I wouldn't say, you know, based on the new crown data, if you've been doing well on electinib for three years, all of a sudden go ahead and switch to lorlatinib. Absolutely not. But if a patient, I, I will say, and, and, and I'm sure you all have been discussing, if somebody is, you know, just diagnosed and they're maybe a couple months into their therapy, haven't had their first interval scan yet, and they're querying, hey, I just started on electinib, I'm four, five, six weeks in, should I switch to lorlatinib? I, I do, I am of the camp that the lorlatinib five-year data is really compelling with the reason that Sharish was articulating about the CNS data. Um, very compelling, I don't believe in saving you know, your best drug for second. Um, and it's not a matter of best or better or comparator, because we'll never have the direct comparison, but 
you know, I think this really sets a new benchmark for not just targeted therapies in ALK, not just targeted therapies in lung cancer, but targeted therapies in the solid tumor overall. And so I am a, a believer in first-line lorlatinib. I saw you raise your microphone, Ross. Were you going to add something? I did. Uh, well, I'm not sure I did. But no, I agree with everything Christine said. I mean, I think the, the debate is how, how long before you do that. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a real-world story. So I had done a remote opinion on someone like the week before ASCO when this data came out in Crown, and I started them on electinib. ASCO came out, I phoned him up, and I said, we need to change to lorlatinib. So there's that bit when you're in the kind of peri -balk area where if you're just playing the numbers, you would want to switch to lorlatinib. But then, as Christine says, if you, if you know you're in the, in, the, in the good ALK plateau, you know, like, I'm good. Awesome. Well, let's move to the next slide here. So... How about that, everyone? Um, I went into the FDA-approved label for each of the three drugs, and I, took, and I took the tables to try to make them as similar as possible. On the left table is all the side effects that are 10% or more for electinib. In the middle is for brigatinib. On the right is lolatinib. I think Ken's trying to make us go blind. Yeah. And, of course, everyone can find that. And this leads into what was... And, and they're so common across. The, they're they're so common across the two. I didn't know that it mattered that Do you much. Think you can? But I wanted to come back to the on the right side of the screen, which Ross touched on in his in his keynote speech. Is what are these definitions of grade one and grade two? And um, if you see for weight gain, there a grade one is less than ten percent gain, and again, grade two is ten to twenty. If you look at the cognitive effects. Grade one, and this is right out of the CTCA, um, mild, not interfering with your activities of daily living, but grade two is interfering with your grade, uh, with your activities of daily living. And in these charts, one and two are grouped together. And so again, as Ross pointed out, it can be really misleading. F fatigue and myalgia, again, grade two, limiting activities of daily living. And peripheral edema, you can see, the, see there, and we saw a picture in Ross's keynote, that edema, which occurs in a, an important segment of patients, can be quite, quite significant and difficult to deal with. In fact, Angel, you and I were talking about that. What do you do when you have some of these troubling side effects and they're doing otherwise fine on the drug from cancer control? Yeah, I think that's a really important question and will play into the debate about, you know, what drug to start. Um, I think from the edema perspective, I have not found a really effective mechanism other than to dose reduce if that's possible. Um, I, you know, we talk about compression stockings, but, you know, they're, I think they're plus minus on efficacy. Um, a lot of times patients will borrow from cardiology and try to see if we can use a diuretic, but um, that will just then impact kidneys and impact patients' hydration status. Um, and then instead of pooping seven times a day, you're peeing 10, 20 times a day. And I don't know that that's any better improvement in your quality of life. Um, so I haven't found a really good solution to how to treat peripheral edema, which is very limiting. I mean, loss of skin folds as grade two and instrumenting, uh, limiting your instrumental ADLs is, is, you know, astounding. It's not something I would ever want to experience. I think some of the other side effects, you know, I think weight gain, like Dr. Kamich um, discussed, we now have really great medications that can help with weight loss, so that should be studied uh, proactively, I think. Then the cognitive side effects too. I, you know, other than a prescription for a psychologist, um, I don't really know how, you know, we talk about it, people will get on antidepressants or things like that, but that has its own thin side effects, right? And so again, I come back to dose reduction if that is possible. Ken, can I make a comment then maybe rewind a little bit? We talk all about these grades of toxicity. But honestly, like, this is something we use in the framework of a clinical trial. I, this is not like the vernacular that you're going to hear in most clinic visits, right? Like, you're not, you know, it, maybe Dr. Kamage, because he's a 
rock star is, 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 is talking about the grades. But I will tell you, like, most of the time when I'm talking to my patients, I'm not saying, hey, you have grade two toxicity. We're articulating what the patient is feeling and thinking. I may be, you know, because we participate in clinical trials, thinking, hey, okay, this is grade two or grade three. But this is probably not something that most of you are going to hear about the grade unless you're on a clinical trial. Is that fair to the audience, to the panel? Yeah, I mean, the, the, way, the way I pitched it is the clinician who's advising the patient, though, might be having that information in their head when they're advising them what to do. And, and that's where I agree that this, I think this... It's not that it's misleading, but it's nowhere near optimal for making those decisions. Yeah, so I mean, if you don't hear like, hey, what's my grade of my toxicity, don't be alarmed. Because it may not be you know, communicated across, especially if you're not on a clinical trial. Because I think this is a framework we use largely for clinical trials, but outside a clinical trial, we're not always grading toxicity as strictly as we are in the framework of a clinical trial. I will just also say, and I apologize that this is all also came up, the weight gain, oh my gosh. It is real and it is a problem and we don't need things that are even more distressing for patients. And so I also agree very strongly with Ross and implore anyone in Big Pharma who's listening, please, please, please make these drugs available to patients because they are not FDA approved for weight loss. It is really hard to get them and they are all on backlog right now. And so we need to be able to access these drugs for patients because the last thing we need is to introduce more and more and more toxicities that are both you know, difficult to deal with and psychologically distressing. So make the drugs available. Please get them. Help us get them for our cancer patients. Ken, I'm just going to mention one thing about management of side effects. Um, particularly now with electinib, patients who have been on it for some time, I've definitely seen fatigue as a side effect. It's not fatigue that they are just laying in bed, but it is impacting their day-to-day -day activity. Um, I have advise patients, um, it's not always work, but I've advised patients um, to maybe skip a day, or uh, if there's a, a function coming and they want to be as active as possible, for three, four days, it is okay to hold the drug. I mean, um, patients obviously uh, will forget to do other things on a day-to-day -day basis, will not forget to take their pills, and that is great. But it is okay uh, to skip uh, uh, for a few days if, if just to allow them to enjoy a particular event or enjoy a particular evening. Um, so uh, I, I feel that sometimes we can manage drug, uh, a toxicity sometimes I have handled instead of just reducing the dose, advising them that um, you know, uh, there's a patient who works as a radiology technician of mine, and she takes electin at 450 BID from Monday to Friday, and on weekend, 600 BID Saturday, Saturday Sunday. Now, uh, would, is that any better than her doing just 450 BID? No, I don't know that, but she feels better that she's maximizing the dose that she's getting. So. There are a couple of things that can be done. Particularly, it is okay to hold the drug for a few days around particular events. Wow, wow, fantastic. Uh, we're gonna move on to the uh, case study now for the last part of our session. We have about another 25 minutes. So we're sticking with first line, and so, so many people in here are on their first line TKI. And so this, this case is a hypothetical case is a 48-year-old with a persistent cough, shortness of breath for three months. Uh, maybe running a half marathon like Nancy, Nancy shared with us. The chest x-ray was done and there was a large right lower lobe mass and associated pleural effusion. Probably sounds similar to some of you. Biopsy showed it was an adenocarcinoma. The MRI didn't show any intracranial brain mets. The molecular testing, which was done right away by the physician, showed that they had an ALK rearrangement and they initiated an ALK TKI. Six months later, they repeated the imaging and the patient had a star stable partial response. Their respiratory symptoms were resolved. The TKI side effects were minimal and they weren't 
weren't um, limiting any activities of daily living. They were back to working full time. They were with their family and were trying to forget that they had lung cancer, right? We've heard, a lot, we've heard about that today. So the patient group and our medical committees, we came up with a table of some of the things that we think should, this should be happening when you're in that state. When you're in your first line, you're doing well, things that are, you're, you're what, what Ross calls the, the maximal response. When you've reached that point in your, in your first line care, there are still things that still need to be done. And we touched on some of those. And so this is the list, and I'd love to get from our panel your thoughts on some of these things. We learned at the summit last year, for example, that a lot of patients weren't getting routine brain scans, even once a year. And we were told by the panel, I know Angel and, and Sharish, you were part of that, that that's something. And we have here um, some suggestions, but we'd really love your advice on the importance of these different things or things that we haven't included that are important for our patient population here to be doing. So I'll throw, I'll throw um, um, one out. Um, laboratory tests. We've been talking about side effects a bit when we were speaking about lalatinib and all these. What's your routine? How often do you, obviously if you find abnormality, you test most often, but what is it what, what would be, if you're starting, if you're on the latinib or electinib or regatinib, what, what do you do? Sharish, do you, we'll start with you, because you always have a good provocative way of. <laughs> Crazy is the other word for provocative. Um, I actually, um, so I like to see patients within seven to 14 days of starting the drug. And, um, prefer to do an inpatient visit. I'm still old school, and I, w I get labs that day. Uh, there is much more cholesterol monitoring with lorlatinib, which we don't do necessarily with other drugs, though I have started looking at cholesterol, particularly in patients who gain weight. There are definitely patients who gain weight on electinib. Um, and then really, if the initial evaluation, in some patients, I may repeat the labs in a couple of uh, weeks again, but then really do, uh, I do scans every three months, at least for the first three, uh, one year, and then get uh, labs uh, each time that we do scans, um, and then followed by a, f a physical exam. Um, I have started, particularly patients who have been on a drug for three, four years, extending that interval. Um, there's a patient who now wants to see me only six months, and I've taken it very personally. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so it is, it, it, you know, it's easier in a way to decide what to do in the beginning. It is challenging in some of these patients who are so long out, particularly on the frontline drug, as to what is the right frequency uh, to assess them. Um, I have in particularly patients um, who have a, a CTDNA positive, I have started testing that in about three months um, and six months, and I try to see the trend. Um, I don't know if I have a definite plan as to what I would do based on those results, but I've, I've started doing that only in the last one year in the newly diagnosed patients. I am not doing uh, the uh, tumor markers as Dr. Kamich is doing, as Ross is doing. I really like the idea of uh, what, what that should trigger uh, in terms of doing PET. Uh, I don't like doing pets uh, to follow disease in the beginning. I think, I personally feel it is a lot easier to follow disease on CT than on a PET scan. And I worry sometimes that PET scans land up taking you down a rabbit hole. But I use pets mainly if uh, I'm not happy with the CT DNA result or if there's anything concerning um, about the CT scan result. And I definitely do um, 
uh, PET scan before doing uh, local consolidative therapy. Can I, can I, Shuj, can I ask one question? So when, when you start, your first scan is at three months. I do one of six weeks. First scan I do um, in every patient, generally in six to eight weeks. And the reason I do in every six to eight weeks is every clinical trial that we do, whether it's a ke chemotherapy trial in the old days or immunotherapy or targeted therapy, the first scan is six to eight weeks. And it is, I, I, it, once that scan has been done, then I go to the three month schedule. Yeah, I'm the same, because I, I thought you were gonna say, that in every scan and the waterfall plot, there's always about 10% of people whose bars are going up. Um, and, you know, like the ultra bad ALKs, and I just want to catch them. Or, or sometimes, so I, had, I had a case last week where a lady had an operation, then she had this, what looked like a local recurrence, her private oncologist put her on alectinib, and then she transferred to me. We did a scan at six weeks, and there was no change at all in this big, avid mass. And it's not cancer, it's a collection after her operation, it's an infection. I, I will tell, tell you that that is even more relevant in the second line setting, uh, because there are definitely patients who continue to, you know, you switch treatments and they continue to progress your uh, next alkyl inhibitor. So, but absolutely, even in the front line, the first scan is six to eight weeks. So, um, Angel, do you have, I see, one of the things that was put on here was a mental health consultation, and at ESMO, there was a presentation about very, very few patients are being sent for psychological or given the opportunity or suggested by their physician. Is that a, a routine thing at Michigan as a part of the, or no? I, Sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, I, I wish it was. Um, I think part of what we're missing, and I wanna put a plug in for supportive palliative care and also these other specialist is that as patients are thankfully living longer we know that these side effects can build up over time it is m more important that we involve a team of physicians to help us take care of our patients because you know um, as an oncologist like maybe the best medication for cholesterol that i learned in medical school may no longer be the way you treat hypercholesterolemia in fact there are drugs that patients take, I'm like, what is this? Um, and or, you know, having a mental health consultation. I think that speaks to the state of mental health care in this country in general, but it is so hard um, to be able to get patients plugged in, and I think it's really important to have that. At ASCO this year, we had one of our plenary sessions was about palliative care in lung cancer, and it has been shown time and time again that if, even if you're doing well, which is what we hope is, but having another set of doctors whose jobs is to take care of you from a symptom management perspective, patients have better outcomes no matter what their scans show. So I think having that, um, early palliative care, we were part of the trial. All of my patients loved having that opportunity, but you know, another service that isn't widely available is palliative care for every patient. So. Um, I, I think that's a great idea that this is on there because so much as an oncologist we're focused on the scans, on the markers, on response rates, there's a lot else that is going on. I, I do wanna say though that um, what we all say here, not everything is set in stone, right? There, there's a lot of um, nuance in, in taking care of patients with lung cancer and it's all very individualized. So I, I don't want anyone to think in the audience that somehow what we all say is necessarily prescriptive. These are just our best practices, but that is something that you should absolutely discuss with your own individual oncologist and figure out of the list of things, of everything we've talked about, dose escalation, de-escalation, frequency of scans, what is the best drug to start with? That is a really important, honest conversation you need to have with your oncologist. I'm just gonna echo, I think this point that Angel just brought up cannot be stressed enough. It takes a team, and I think the way I articulate it is, who's your quarterback? So maybe your oncologist is your quarterback, but you have multiple people in the oncology clinic. You may have a nurse practitioner who's working with the, the, the oncologist, uh, a pharmacist who's so important to make sure all the medications are reconciled and appropriate. Please, everyone needs a primary care doctor. I am a 
really big believer in we treat people, not cancer. And so that means that all the things that you know, are age-related need to be addressed too. You need your colonoscopies, your mammograms, all of the normal stuff. You know, we're in cancer clinic, we're gonna be hyper-focused on, like Angel said, the markers, the scans, but everything else can happen too. And I've seen too many patients, and this is horrible. We're like treating the cancer, the cancer's going well, and then something else pops up. We treat people, not cancer. And so to do that, we need to call, you know, phone a friend sometimes. We need nephrologists, kidney doctors. We need heart doctors. We need pharmacists. We need APPs, advanced you know, nurse practitioners. The oncologist may be the quarterback, and you may think about it, that person that way to help coordinate and shepherd the care. But really, it's a, a coordinated team across many, many, many different specialties to treat the person, not the cancer. Can I pick up on that one, Ken? Please. So, so two things, and just sort of inspired by Christine and Angel here. So one is, as we get people who are out on that right-hand side of the curve, I actually start to have discussions with them about going back for mammography and colonoscopy and all of the other things. Because if our aspirational goal is for everyone in this room to live as if they don't have cancer, and have a kind of life that was like, yeah, yeah, I've got cancer, but you know, I, I forgot to mention it, it's not a big deal. Then we have to you know, look after all of your other health issues because the major side effect of successful treatment is getting older. The other thing I would really like to see as a separate line item on here is support for care partner. And that, picking up on what Angel said, there isn't, to my knowledge, you know, a, a code for billing your insurance so that your care partner can get counseling. And so that, that, that's a huge unplowed field. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> in the middle of this chart, there uh, is consultation with a surgeon and consultation with a rad onc. And Raj, you and I had a discussion a, a week or so ago and let's start with radiation oncology. You told me you'd had a, a patient who contacted you who said the radiation oncologist wanted them to stop their TKI for six weeks around the radiation. That seems, all, that seems a bit long. What, 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 is, what is the standard of practice for stopping TKIs around surgery or radiation oncology? Well, surgery's easy because they don't really understand drugs and so they usually want you to stop it like ouch <laughs> ouch no surgeons. no surgeons in the room here <laughs> there's at least one i know okay. oh there is yeah. he says with love sorry there there are these like magic stuff that you take and it has an what y'all can't see what i'm gonna i'm sorry i'm gonna call out ross for a second because i just love him so much his socks have elephants on them <laughs> i love it so much oh he showed it i'm sorry i missed that it's the elephant in the room <laughs> um, so, oh, I was going back to beating up surgeons, right? Um, so they want you to stop the drug like when you're nil by mouth for the operation and when you can take surgery after. And they might phone you up and they might say, is this going to interfere with healing? And you go, no, and then they're fine with it. So they're not the problem child here. So that was actually a compliment to surgeons. Um, radiation oncologists, and, and Christine and Sharice and Angel know this, is that I was once a radiation oncologist, which is maybe why I have such an interest in this is we're taught as radiation oncologists that combining a new drug or, or having a drug going with radiation is unsafe until proven otherwise. And so particularly people are sort of like, oh, you've got to stop it, even though they have no data that it's unsafe. And so I think sometimes you do have to push the envelope, and sometimes you trip over a hurdle, as I mix my metaphors. But in general, I feel very uncomfortable for long periods of time off a targeted therapy. If they want to hold it, you know, the day of SBRT, that's fine. Again, it's like not understanding the drug. The drug's still in your system. It's like we're treating ourselves. That was my answer. Yeah, so stop. <laughs> <laughs> so stopping for a few days, whatever a few days would be, would be, well, you already do that anyway, so you're not, you're Just, be comfortable. No, I, I, I don't do it unless the patient wants to. Sheree <laughs> goes, he goes rogue. Sheree what, what, understands drugs. What I will say about the radiation is I, I completely agree. I think that sense was because the previous drugs were cytotoxic chemotherapy. And yes, there can be kind of uh, increased toxicity when you're combining uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy with 
with radiation, which may not necessarily do with the TKIs. I, I do want to say that I hope, um, and going back to the quarterback uh, metaphor, I, I love calling myself quarterback. You can imagine a five foot six Indian <laughs> who can barely hold a football uh, calling himself a quarterback, and I do that all the time. But, but what you're I very, will you're say very fast, is... Though. <laughs> uh, sorry. You're very fast. Yeah. What I will say is that um, I hope those consultations come after a discussion between the medical oncologist and the patient. Um, I hope that, and I don't think that that was the message, but I hope nobody has um, assumed after the discussion we have had that at six months, all of you should go and seek a radiation oncology consult, surgical oncology consult. Because despite our hope that we come to a state where we can consider local consolidative therapy, it doesn't happen in every patient. Um, and so if it doesn't happen, it, is, it may be okay in your case, okay? So, uh, and there is not, I mean, six months is kind of a broad uh, sense of when that should happen. It's not kind of a definite time point. So I just wanted to emphasize that it's after a very detailed discussion. Now, after that, if you feel your medical oncologist is just not being innovative enough or aggressive enough, it is fine to go and I, I would suggest at that point get another second opinion, uh, maybe from the expert opinion process that our positive group has. Uh, but I, I really, really feel that it should be done after a consultation with the medical oncologist. Can I make a comment? First, I'm going to comment and say, I, I would be on your team any day, Sharish. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I don't know how to take that, Sharish, actually. Is that, are you saying you don't trust me with it? I would never be able to throw it to you. I I just want to echo this, too. I mean, th this is, although we may all practice this way and a lot of people do, it's not necessarily standard of care yet. You're not gonna find this everywhere across the United States and across the world. It's evolving. And so much of what we talk about is evolving. And these kind of discussions necessitate multidisciplinary conversations in a tumor board. And a couple of like nuances here. Not all thoracic surgeons are the same. I mean, there are some thoracic surgeons that may do a heart surgery one day, one sur one, you know, for a few hours and then do a lung sur surgery the next few hours. That's not the same as a surgeon who's doing only lung cancer surgery. And so, you know, the nuances of just like all of us only treat lung cancer and some oncologists, God bless them, treat every kind of cancer there is. And so, you know, these conversations are super nuanced. They, in my opinion, must be you know, had in a multidisciplinary mannerism with, with experts who are thinking about this because we are not surgeons. And only a surgeon can say, hey, I'm able to cut this out or not. And only a radiation oncologist can say, yes, I can radiate this safely or not. Because safety is the most important thing here. So can I make a comment about the surgery and radiation and how to hold? So I don't think that there are guidelines for um, when to hold and how long to hold. And I think the procedures are very different. So for example, if someone is getting surgery, I would actually try to phone the surgeon and kind of get an understanding of how extensive this surgery is and the healing time. And then I talk to my pharmacist about half-lives and she and I come up with what we think is a roughly appropriate time of you know, holding the TKI. And as Dr. Cambridge says, maybe I'm more treating myself than, than this is evidence-based. For radiation though, I also do talk to radiation oncologists because radiation to different parts of the body, they're different, right? So um, there is some data, at least in the EGFR world, that if you do lung radiation and are on concurrent TKI, there's a higher risk for pneumonitis, so inflammation of your lungs. Um, so if we're getting radiation, let's say it's like a pallet radiation for something in a bone somewhere and it's a short time course, I am not so worried about it, but if I'm considering like thoracic consolidation radiation for a patient, that is when I do have a conversation with radiation oncologist about the duration of this course. And that is when, again, I turn to my pharmacist and we talk about what is appropriate time to hold. Just 
going to mention, and this may not uh, apply to this group because this is in newly diagnosed patients. Um, I think uh, Ross's group published this about a certain higher risk of developing blood clots uh, and pulmonary embolism in ALK patients. And one of the things, it's probably a minor issue, but, but I just wanted to mention it. In newly diagnosed patients in particular, um, I like to assess their potential risk for developing a blood clot. Um, and I, I start them on prophylactic uh, anticoagulation uh, because uh, particularly if they have uh, brain metastasis, and I would love Ross to discuss his, the data that, that uh, his group published. I also want to mention the spiritual health. I don't think, at least I'm not aware of any data. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's not, uh, to me, it's spiritual that is uh, not necessarily just about religion, uh, but these patients, particularly the patients who live for a long period of time, um, kind of their um, uh, relationship or their, uh, particularly in the context of the, of the lung cancer, um, to higher being or, or something beyond a personal state, something we have not evaluated. Uh, I've read a couple of articles recently and I felt very interested in kind of evaluating this further. And I would, I would suggest this is a good group uh, to, s to study this. It's a difficult area to study and I have absolutely no expertise in it, but I think it is going to be relevant as we move forward. Um, but I'd love for Ross to talk about the blood clot data. <laughs> I can, I can talk about both, but um, so the, there's about a 30% chance of blood clots in ALK at diagnosis, and by diagnosis, like uh, I think it was plus or minus 90 days from your initial diagnosis, but it's related to the active cancer. So when you go on an active treatment, the risk goes down, I believe, to, to normal in the sense that sometimes when you progress, if you're not on an anticoagulant, that could be another trigger for clots. So you start everybody on prophylactic anticoagulation from? I don't know everybody, but if they have a high volume of disease or have their brain meds, I start them on a prophylactic dose of Eliquis 2.5 BID. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't do that, but we should study it. Yeah. And so I wanna, this is the spiritual side. So I think, you know, props to you for even bringing that up. So I, I always read the books that the patients give me, even if they're terrible. Um, but I got given one a few weeks Ross, back. you definitely have opinions about surgeons' books. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, but I read this great book, and it's, maybe you've heard of it. It's called The Untethered Soul. And I just thought it was amazing, just a way of dealing with the, uh, the happiness of uncertainty. So that's, that's my recommendation. Kirk, how much time do we have left, or have we gone over? Are we... If I got the mic, um, so we got about nine. We got about nine minutes. So if we could take a could take a question, I do want to add one thing about this group, which I, I just love. I love their conversations. We month two months ago we had uh, our first scientific advisory panel dinner at ASCO, which we want to, as an organization, eventually have a scientific advisory board. And it was this group, and Vincent, and Ben Solomon, and Dr. U, I think of, and Trevor Bavona, and it was like a, like this, this family reunion of people, including us as patients that are part of it, where there's just this genuine love and caring about it. So it's like a family reunion you remove your dumb racist uncle <clears throat> and you, re you replace him with the smartest people in the business. And I wish everybody had the chance to observe those kind of discussions at that kind of incident. So I just wanted, I wanted to add that. So if anybody has questions, if you want to raise your hand and stand up, I'll come out and, and give you the mic. Well, while we're um, getting questions, can I make a quick comment? Just going back to something we talked about before. Um, Going back to like the, hey, it takes a village and it, it, there's a lot of doctors involved. Something I also tell all my patients and communicate to other doctors, I own the cancer. Because I've seen too many doctors say they won't do something because the patient has lung cancer. 
that is not acceptable in my opinion. So not, not every doctor who's not an oncologist understands the nuances of cancer care because cancer care is really nuanced and sophisticated in a good way right now. But I own the cancer, and so I say, t approach this patient as if they don't have cancer. Talk to me about what, what you want to do. Let's come up with a coordinated plan. Please don't ever deny a patient something because they have cancer de facto. And think about that when you're communicating with other doctors who, not that anyone would purposely do anything harmful, but I think there is still a common misperception across a lot of physicians. Lung cancer is bad in all cases. Not everyone has seen lung cancer patients live for years and years and years, and not everyone knows the amazing therapies we have right now. And so I own the cancer as the oncologist. You don't deny my patients something because they have lung cancer until you talk to me about it. One other point. This is super, this is going to sound really boring, but I think it's really important. Please get copies of your medical records. It is unbelievably difficult to get medical records sent from site to site. You would not believe how challenging it is to get scans and records sent from, you know, one medical center to another. Get copies of your molecular reports, get copies of your scans, get copies of your scan reports, keep them with you. That is super helpful for you if you're traveling. It's super helpful for us if you're coming to see one of us. It's just good practice and would, is my advice to all my patients. Okay, my name is Joan Kennedy. I'm from Maryland. My question is, as we were talking about the, um, the different tests, I know that, the, I guess I wanna understand what we find out from the CT scan versus the PET scan versus the MRI. What, what's the progression there? Because I'm having, the other thing I wanted to say is it's nerve wracking when you, uh, when you do try to talk about changing and extending the time, for me, extending the time between the tests. But so I wanted to find out just what your thoughts are and what you learn differently from those three different scans. So what I tell my patients is the, the reason I like using CT scans um, is that it gives us a really good accurate measurement of size, um, better than a PET scan. And so when we are thinking about what does the cancer look like, we want to know is it changing? Um, and that is what a CT scan is. And I can't explain to you all the technologies. I don't understand it. Um, an MRI then, though, is a little bit more specific. So it looks at things like soft tissue a little bit better, bones a little better, and most importantly for all of us, your brain. A CT scan, a PET scan, does not give you the level of detail in the brain as an MRI. And for that reason, I get MRIs of the brain wherever possible the patient can tolerate it because we want to know if there's any little blip of change that suggests that perhaps the cancer is doing something in the brain. A PET scan um, is taking like radio labeled glucose, so it's sugar, and basically what happens is it goes to areas of the body that is the most active, because when it's active, it takes up the sugar. So there are things that are lighting up that are normal, like your brain lights up because you're a very active brain, so don't ever think that a pet, even those from head to toe, looks at your brain, your heart, um, that lights up too. Where I find pets to be helpful is that there's something a little bit that I can't understand on the CT. So um, this little blip that I'm seeing now, is that related to cancer? Is it not? Um, that's when I get a PET scan because while PET is not definitive for di diagnosis of cancer by any means, it gives a little bit of idea of the activity of something that's happening on a CT. And I'm like, I have suspicion, and now the PET is lighting up. That is what pushed me to the next step of maybe thinking about a biopsy. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is um, the PET scan, as, as Angel said, the, the resolution is not as good. So you're like measuring really small things in your lungs is not as good on a PET scan. Where its strength is, is in areas that a CT scan can't really see. So it can tell you whether a lymph node, which is a pre-existing anatomical structure, we've all got lymph nodes, has got cancer in it or not. You know, maybe it's lighting up or not, but the size is different. And also in the example I showed you in deposits in the bone, which are sometimes very hard to see, to see on CT. So it, it extends out the areas that you can see, but it's not the eye of God. And so there's a combination of these two things. I just add that there is a perception 
that PET scan is a better test. Um, they both have their roles, uh, yes, and uh, I will tell you patients who have predominantly bone metastatic disease, I, I, I said I like to do CT scans. Yes, in those patients, I will follow them with PET scans. So, um, it, but, but I, there shouldn't be a perception that PET scan is a better test. Uh, each of these tests have their own importance, and again, it needs to be individualized, sorry. Let's hear it for our fabulous panel. Thank you all so much.